It's a great pleasure for me to be with you at this Xenos conference. Well, I am with you in a sense, certainly in spirit, but I'm actually speaking to you from London. And it's very kind of you to allow me to do that. There are medical reasons for me not being able to travel so much these days. You'll also notice that I am seated, but then I assume that you are seated as well. There's very good biblical precedent for teachers being seated, because we read in Scripture that the Lord Jesus himself sat and taught. So thank you again for inviting me, and I'm just sorry that I can't directly experience the wonderful atmosphere at your conference that I so much enjoyed the last time. Now, our topic for today, the first major topic, is the living word and the creation of the universe. And the universe revealed by the Bible is a created universe. In fact, the first few words of the Bible are foundational for our understanding of that absolutely vital fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are many biblical references like this one to the fact that God created the universe, but there are not so many that refer to how God did it. Yet in some of the key places where the Bible talks about how God created, there is explicit reference to the role of the Word of God. Hence our title, the living word and the creation of the universe. Genesis 1 repeatedly uses the phrase, and God said, to describe God's creation activity. Though Genesis 1 does not explicitly use the term, the word of God, although that implication is completely obvious. The first explicit use of the expression Word of God in connection with creation occurs in Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. This statement is echoed in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, it's very clear that what the Bible means in these verses by God speaking, or the Word of God, is not quite the same as what I mean when I say I am speaking, or when I use the expression, my word, as in, I give you my word. My word or speech has no creative power. If I say, let there be light, nothing happens. And the difference is revealed to us in John chapter 1 where we discover that the term word, biblically speaking, has got an altogether more profound meaning. Indeed, God himself is the word. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So here is a series of very important statements about existence, about the way things are, about what is the case. The first thing is, the Word already was. And that is a statement that the Word is eternal. The Word, who is God, never came to exist. He always has existed. Now, the Greek word that John uses here is the word logos. And in Greek philosophy, it was used for the rational principle that some believed was behind the universe. Ideas of thought, of reason, of expression, of speech, of message, of command. In the Bible, we often read in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and so on and so forth. 
For as in Genesis, we read, and God said. That is, creation is a sequence of speech acts where God spoke. The Word was with God, the Word was God. That brief phrase is very profound, and it has deep relevance to our ideas of God being a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here we are told that the Word was with God, and yet the Word was God. And I suppose one of the ideas that can make this meaningful for us is the notion that God is a fellowship. He experiences relationship within himself. And it's important to note that the Trinity is not a Christian formulation of a set of ideas. T.F. Torrance once said, this is the way God has revealed himself. He has revealed himself as a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, the implication is that since God is a fellowship within himself, we humans were not created because God was lonely. That is simply not true. And then the next thing is the word in relation to creation. All things were made by him, says John. More literally translated, it's all things came to be through him. So here is the biblical answer to the philosopher's great question, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is all things came to be through the Word. So the Word is eternal, the universe is not eternal. The Word did not come to be, the universe came to be. And so therefore, the Word, who is God, is ultimate reality. We might notice, of course, that scientists did not put the universe there, nor did science. I was very amused on one occasion having a little discussion with Peter Atkins, a famous physical chemist at Oxford who is an atheist, and he said, mathematics created the universe. And I'm afraid I laughed because that is sheer nonsense. Two plus two equals four, I said to him, but that has never put four pounds or four dollars in your pocket. Mathematics never created anything. And so this is a very important thing for us to realize, that this universe came to be. It is therefore not the ultimate reality as many atheists hold. Now, the New Testament unpacks this even further and talks about Christ, who is the Word of God, who is preeminent in creation. The world was created through him, and it was created for him. And that gives to history a glorious direction, because of Christ as the beginner and is the fulfiller, and the completer and ultimate goal, then all things in the end gain their meaning from him. And that has huge implications. And please notice these statements in Scripture are not merely statements expressing subjective devotion. They are statements about what actually is the case. They're not merely claiming that Jesus was unique in the degree to which he as a human being was close to God. That isn't faith, but it's opposite. That's unbelief. John says that he was unique in kind. He was nothing less than God incarnate. We might notice as well the little addition that John makes. Without him, nothing came to be that came to be. That answers very neatly the famous assertion of Richard Dawkins, who says, if you ask and say that God created the world, then you'll have to ask who created the Creator. But half a moment, if you ask who created the Creator, you are assuming that the Creator is created. That is, He came to be, 
And John turns around and tells us, well, if the Creator came to be, then he was created by the Word, which ends up talking sheer nonsense. Created gods are a delusion. And indeed, when Richard Dawkins faced me with this question, I turned it back on him, and I said to him, you believe the universe created you. Well, who created your Creator? I've waited over 10 years to get an answer from that. So, where have we got to? The Word is primary. The universe is derivative. And we should notice that that is the opposite of the dominant philosophy in academia today. Because it is widely believed that the universe, or the multiverse, so-called, or mass energy, or even nothing, is primary, and everything else is derivative, including mind and the idea of God, because, of course, they do not believe there is a God. The biblical view is the exact opposite of that. God is primary. He is the ultimate reality. Word is primary. And everything else is derivative, including the mass energy of the universe. The universe, I hold, bears evidence of being the product of an intelligent mind. First in its laws that we code in mathematical form and its structures. But not only that, we have lived to see and discover the genetic code. And we find that at the heart of each one of the 10 trillion cells in our bodies, there is a massive database, but it's more than the database. It is like a computer code. It encodes information and acts like a program to construct all kinds of complex machines within the human cell. So we have information encoded there. And that sits perfectly with the idea that there's information at the heart of the universe. In the beginning was the Word. And here is an answer that we can use to point out the falsity of the idea that science and Christianity are in conflict, that it's impossible to be a scientist and believe that there is a God and that Jesus is the Son of God. The fascinating thing is that the existence of DNA Whatever natural processes may be involved, the fact that it's a code that encodes information resonates wonderfully with the idea that the originator of the universe is an encoder, a word. And when we look at this, we discover that there are even easier ways to see that science and faith in God are not in conflict. For instance, if we think of the Nobel Prize for Physics, it was won a year or two ago by a Scotsman who is called uh, Peter Higgs, and it was won a few years before that by an American called Bill Phillips, both brilliant physicists. But the interesting thing is that Higgs is an atheist and Phillips is a Christian. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me that the simplistic idea that science and faith in God are in conflict is simply false. Because otherwise, you would expect all Nobel Prize winners, certainly, to be unbelievers. Now, let's get clear what is going on here. There is a conflict, but I do not believe it is between science and faith in God. The conflict is between two worldviews. The worldview of atheism, or naturalism, and the worldview of theism. And it may actually interest you to know that in the 100 years between 1900 and 2000, over 60% of all Nobel Prize winners were believers in God. That surprises many people. Another point that's useful to make is this, that we have a great Christian legacy in our culture. 
our institutions, our universities, our hospitals, and so on. This is something that we're used to. But what we often forget is that actually science as we know it today, modern science, is part of the Christian legacy. When modern science arose in the 16th and 17th centuries through people like Galileo and Kepler and Newton and Clark Maxwell, they were all believers in God. And that is no accident. C.S. Lewis put it very well. He said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believe in a lawgiver. Let me put it really bluntly to you. I am not remotely ashamed of being both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. Now, with all this in mind, we now turn to the beginning of the Bible, to Genesis, which is foundational for the rest of the biblical story. It gives us what we call a meta-narrative, a big picture, a big story into which our lives can be fitted and from which they can derive their meaning. And we need to look now at some aspects of this big story. What does Genesis 1 tell us in particular about God? What does the living word tell us about the living God? In the beginning, God. That is, of course, making a profound truth claim that the universe or nature is not the creator, but God is the creator. And of course, this is an issue at the heart of the battle in our culture. You will be told, as I've mentioned, that the real battle is between science and God, and science has shown God to be a delusion so that you have to choose between science and God. But that is not where the battle is. The real battle is between the belief that there is a God and the belief that there is no God. Now, you'll notice that the Bible begins simply by stating there is a God. In the beginning, God. There's no supporting evidence given. And that shouldn't mislead us into thinking that the author of Genesis or any other author in the Bible had no evidence both Genesis and the rest of the Bible will subsequently offer us a great deal of evidence. But the very manner in which this book begins, by assuming there is a God, in the beginning God, reminds us that every worldview must begin somewhere. The biblical worldview begins with God, and then we have to investigate the evidence that that is true. C.S. Lewis once put this kind of thing like this. He said, I believe in Christianity much as I believe in the sun, not because I see it, but because in its light I see everything else. And so one of the criteria for the truth of Scripture is its analysis of everything else. And as we see what it says about everything else, we come to gain confidence in its fundamental assertions about God. So, the first claim is there is a God, and the second is that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, that means that God is the creator of everything. Why is that important? Well, because many leading thinkers like Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins, when they look at people like me who are Christians, they say that we believe in a God of the gaps. That is, we can't explain something, and we say, therefore, God must have done it. And of course, if you take that view, the more science advances, the less space there is for God and then God eventually disappears. But please notice exactly what Genesis says. It does not say, in the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the bits we do understand and the bits we don't. The whole show. What does that mean? 
It means that God is not threatened by the advance in science. Isaac Newton had the right attitude. When he discovered gravitation, he didn't say, oh, now, I've got the law of gravitation. I don't need God. No. He said, isn't God a marvelous, a genius of a God who did it that way? The more he understood of how nature worked, the more he admired the God who did it that way. So this statement, God created the heavens and the earth, that is everything, is extremely important because it means that God, I repeat, is not threatened by advance in science. So we come to a universe that has a beginning. Now that's also a fascinating thing. We're used to it because here, contemporary science runs exactly in parallel with the Bible, because the general view in cosmology is that there was a beginning. But this is relatively recent. Indeed, the idea that there might have been a beginning first began to filter into science through Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest and an astronomer. For centuries, most of Europe had believed that the universe was eternal. It didn't have a beginning. But the evidence started to grow and grow and grow from the scientific side that the universe had a beginning. The fact that the universe appeared to be expanding and so on. And then the discovery of the microwave background, the echo of the beginning of the universe. And because I'm old, as you see, I remember the 1960s. And I remember when the pressure from science was getting very great to say there must have been a beginning to space-time. The interesting thing is it was resisted. One of our leading scientists, who was editor of the most famous scientific periodical in the world, called Sir John Maddox, wrote an article an editorial saying that the idea of a beginning was thoroughly unacceptable. Why? Because it implied an ultimate origin of our world and gave those who believed in the biblical doctrine of creation, I quote, ample justification for their belief. Isn't it ironical that in the 16th century some people resisted advance in science because it seemed to threaten belief in God, that is, the advance that said that the earth was not motionless. And now, here in the 20th century, an advance in science, perhaps the greatest advance in cosmology in the 20th century, was resisted because it was so close to what the Bible said. In fact, one of the co-discoverers of the microwave background that I mentioned, Arno Penzias, wrote subsequently this very interesting comment on Scripture. The best data we have concerning the Big Bang, he wrote, are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Now, I've used, Pentheus used the word Big Bang there. No Christian should be nervous of that because it's simply saying we believe the universe had a beginning. How the universe came to be, they don't know. The Bible supplies that by telling us that the universe was created by God. Now, <clears throat> it's clear from Scripture that if everything that came to be came to be through the Word, the universe was created from nothing. That is, nothing physical. And that, of course, poses a huge problem for contemporary cosmologists. How do you get something from nothing? Now, the biblical answer is very clear. The universe comes from nothing physical, but it doesn't come from nothing. It comes from God. God created all physical being. And it's interesting to see 
how some leading scientists comment on it. Alan Sandage, widely regarded as the father of modern astronomy, discoverer of quasars and winner of the Crawford Prize, which is astronomy's equivalent of the Nobel Prize, says this, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something rather than nothing. But atheists, since they cannot turn to the God answer, have to find some way of explaining the existence of the universe. How does something come from nothing? And one of the most famous answers, actually, is given to us by Stephen Hawking. He says, spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. And then he says this astonishing thing. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And when I read that, I thought, what? Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But that's a flat contradiction. And secondly, what would you mean by the universe creating itself? After all, if I say to you, X creates Y, what I'm saying roughly is that if you've got X, you'll get Y. And if I say X creates X, what am I saying? Well, I'm saying if you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? Well, I'm afraid it means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if scientists write it. And this is the astonishing thing, that in order to get away from the biblical idea that there is a God who created everything, some of the most brilliant minds in the world are resorting to what, on analysis, turned out to be complete nonsense. The biblical view is to be preferred, massively preferred, on intellectual grounds and on logical grounds. But let's move on a little bit with Genesis. God existed eternally. God has created the universe. But God is distinct from the universe. God is eternal. The universe is not. The universe is not some kind of emanation out of God, like sun rays emanating from the sun. Matter is made out of nothing, not out of God. So the Genesis account bears no traces of pantheism, nor is there any trace of polytheism. And it is very noticeable that in Genesis 1, the sun, the moon, and the stars are described purely physically as lights, there's no hint of conferring any kind of divinity on them as in the contemporary pagan mythologies. Now, this is actually important. Some people believe, actually, that Genesis is written as a polemic against polytheism. I'm not so sure about that, but in what it asserts, it's clearly diametrically opposed to polytheism that is to an idolatrous interpretation of the universe, whether of the ancient pagan kind or the modern secular kind. So the universe is distinct from God. And therefore the Bible clashes head on with all those ancient polytheistic interpretations, the Babylonian, Canaanite, and Egyptian. Indeed, all of those views are so different from the Bible in another very important particular. Because, as you will know, all of those mythologies are full of gods, but their gods actually come from the primeval matter of the universe. That is, technically speaking, they are material gods. The God of the Bible is not 
descended from the physical universe. He created the physical universe. And that's a very important answer to people that say to us, well, you, say addressing me, you're an atheist with regard to Aphrodite and Zeus and all that. And I agree, yes, I am. And then they say, we just go one God further, and we're atheists with respect to the God of the Bible. They don't know what they're talking about because they think that those ancient gods and the God of the Bible all belong to the same category. They do not. Let me repeat it. The God of the Bible created the heavens and the earth. All those ancient gods descended from the heavens and the earth. But there's more about God in Genesis 1. God is personal. The verbs, God said, God saw that it was good, God blessed, and above all, God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them, are clear indications that God is a person and not a force. There are great dangers in a Star Wars mentality that conceives of God as a force. Because, of course, we are persons, and we regard ourselves to be superior to forces, we harness and use forces. And the great danger is that if we think of God as a force, we might wrongly imagine that he's some kind of power that we can use, rather than regarding him as our creator and Lord, who is worthy of a due our allegiance and worship. It is for him to use us, not for us to use him. So God is personal, but he's more than a person. Because Genesis 1 talks about the Spirit of God hovering above the waters and records God as saying, let us make man in our image. No explanation is given at this point, but you can see the doctrine of the Trinity being anticipated here. Now, God, through Genesis, is progressively revealing himself through his word. And our understanding, of course, rapidly ties itself in knots. For instance, it can tie itself in knots very quickly in over this matter of the Trinity. How can God be three in one? C.S. Lewis comes to our aid to a certain extent here and says that if you have a cube in geometry, six squares, six different squares, but one single cube. The cube is different from a square. And that gives us some little idea of how we might imagine that it is possible to have diversity within unity. Although such illustrations may well be helpful, they often go way beyond our uh, limited capacity to understand. And perhaps it might be useful if I was to give an illustration of what can sometimes happen here. I once gave a lecture on science of God to a large group of physicists at a major research establishment. And one came up afterwards and said, I really enjoyed that lecture, but don't you have a problem? I said, what's the problem? Well, he said, I seem to detect from your lecture, he was quite sharp, this chap, that you are a Christian. And as a Christian, aren't you obliged to believe that Jesus Christ was simultaneously God and human? How can you as a scientist explain that? So I said, look, may I ask you a question first? He said, sure. And I said, look, Tell me, what is consciousness? He said, I don't know. Oh, I said, okay, let me try something easier. What is energy? Well, he said, we can measure it, use it. I said, that's not my question. What is it? He said, I don't know. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. You don't know what energy is, and you don't know what consciousness is. Do you believe in them? Yes, he said, I do. Oh, I said, that's fascinating. You don't know what they are, and yet you believe in them. Should I write you off as a physicist 
And he put up his hands and he said, please don't, please don't. And I said, okay, but you were going to write me off five minutes ago when you thought I couldn't explain to you how Jesus is human and God at the same time. Well, he said, I'm not going to write you off now. I said, that's good. But let me probe you, I said. Why do you believe in consciousness and energy when you don't really know what they are? I said, is it possibly because somewhere these concepts have got explanatory power for you? And he said, exactly. Well, I said, that's precisely one of the reasons why I believe that Jesus is both God and human, because those explanations, although very difficult to grasp and unify, are the only explanations that make sense to me of the data available to me. And he said, we need to talk, and we did. But that's another story, ladies and gentlemen, not to be told now. In other words, what I'm suggesting is this. When we consider these things, they're huge ideas. We mustn't allow our inability sometimes to put them together to stop us believing all that Scripture says. And so when the New Testament says of Christ that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation— all things were created through him. I don't completely understand that. But I do believe it. I do believe those staggering claims that imply that Christ created space-time. It was he that designed the blueprint for human beings. And nothing makes sense about him unless he is precisely who he claimed to be, the Word of God incarnate. Science cannot rule God out. Jesus Christ has ruled him in. We need to look now a little bit more at the detail here in Genesis 1. There's a sequence of days, and the primary impression that the text gives us is that God didn't do everything at once. And God said, and God said, and God said. So there is a sequence. The second thing is the sequence has a beginning and it has an ending. And that raises a lot of very interesting questions. Two in particular. What is the nature of the sequence and what is its goal? Well, the sequence starts in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Then we're told the earth was without form and void and God starts to speak. And the sequence of days are delineated from each other by, and God said. They are creative steps. They are organizational steps by which God shapes the world and fills it with living creatures. And we can look at these days in several different ways. Firstly, as a sequence from one to six, and also two sets of three, one to three and four to six, that are parallel in the sense that in one you have light, and in four the heavenly lights, the sun and the moon, in two the separation between waters below and above, in five the fish and the birds that occupy the waters and the air. In three you have earth, dry land and plants and animals, and in six, you have the land, animals, and finally, humans. So you can think of the first three and the second three as two panels, one shaping the form of the world, and three to six shaping the fullness. Now, of course, <clears throat> the fact that they parallel each other doesn't mean that they are not chronological, and consecutive. The next thing you notice is that it's describing the world we're familiar with. It's not fantastical, describing mythical beasts and gods and magic. It's the world we know, with its earth and sea, its sky and its stars, its plants and trees, and fish and fowl, and of course human beings. 
That's a reason for trusting the text. It accords with what we know. Now, in describing creation stepwise, the Genesis narrative is not simply informing us how the universe came to exist. It's also saying why it came to exist. And that's why Genesis emphasizes not only the processes of creation, but also God's organization of the universe in general and the earth in particular. In order for it to function as a suitable home for human beings. You see, when we see a sequence of things, whether steps or days or numbers, leading up and stopping, we always ask ourselves, where is this sequence leading? The answer in Genesis is clear. The pinnacle of God's creation are human beings. Day six, made in the image of God. So everything's moving towards that, creating and shaping a home fit for human beings. Now, it's very interesting because there's a scientific perspective in this. The idea that the universe is fine-tuned, that so many things have to be just right about it in order for it to be possible for carbon-based life to exist. Indeed, I quoted Arno Penzias, the Nobel Prize winner, earlier. Let me quote him again. Astronomy, he says, leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might even say, supernatural plan. There is a scientist talking about the special na nature of our universe. And he's, in that sense, echoing Genesis and saying this is evidence of a supernatural plan. Each of the steps, each of the days, is initiated by God speaking and God said. And that's really unpacking John 1 for us. In the beginning was the Word. Hebrews 11, by faith we understand that the universe was made by the Word of God. And so, let's put it this way. The universe did not come to be without an input from God himself. Now, we've already seen that Genesis claims that God is distinct from his creation. And therefore, the implication is this, that the universe in which we live, the physical universe, is not a closed system of cause and effect, as many atheists believe it to be. It is an open system, and God creates and he speaks step by step until the work of creation is finished. And I mentioned it before, and I mentioned it again now, that one of the greatest evidences that this is a word-based creation is the fact that DNA, the human genome, for instance, is the longest word we've ever discovered, 3.5 billion letters in a four-letter chemical alphabet. But nonetheless, with all the properties of a word, because it codes for something. Let me put it this way. Here is information, and information encoded on a molecule, but information, ladies and gentlemen, is not physical. It's immaterial. And here's one of the great ironies. So many thinkers like Hawking and Dawkins and so on are trying to tell us that the material is everything, the natural is everything, and yet, Staring us in the face is digital information encoded in DNA, which is not material. And therefore, it cannot have been produced by material processes. Now, that's a huge subject. I just want us to notice that the move in Genesis 1 
from one day to the next is not accomplished by unguided natural processes. And God said, without that, you wouldn't go from one stage to the next. Now, very interestingly, on two of those days, God speaks more than once, on day three and day six. On day three, it is to make the distinction between non-life and life, the inorganic and the organic. On day six, God speaks more than once to make the distinction between animals and human beings. Now, it strikes me as if the author of Genesis almost anticipated a contemporary debate, the origin of life and the origin of human life. Now, let me word this very carefully. What I'm saying is, according to the Scripture, you do not get from non-life to life without the statement, and God said. It doesn't therefore happen by an unguided natural process. Without God speaking, there's an unbridgeable discontinuity. And similarly, you do not, according to Genesis, get from animals to human beings simply by physical nature working through blindly all its conceivable permutations. No, it's and God said. And it almost looks as if the writer of Genesis foresaw the contemporary debate. But let's just think now briefly about that final step. Let us make man in our own image, and God made them male and female. The interesting thing here is unique of all that God made. Only humans are said to be made in his image. The universe, the stars, the sun, the plants, the mountains, the sea, they all show his glory, but they are not made in his image. You are as a human being. And that means that every human being has incalculable value. The galaxies are beautiful. They're vast. But you know they exist. They don't know that you exist. You are more significant than a galaxy. Indeed, we ought to be aware that size is not necessarily a reliable measure of value, as any woman can tell you, as she looks at the diamonds on her finger and compares them with lumps of coal that are made of the same stuff but a lot bigger. And on top of all of that, we human beings have been gifted with a phenomenal facility. You see, and God said, and God said, and God said. That's spectacular, and it's enormously important. But there's something even bigger than that. And that is when God created human beings. Genesis text says this, and God said to them. That is, the image of God means, at the very least, that here are creatures that uniquely can hear the Word of God and can communicate with God. That is absolutely magnificent. And God put these human beings as stewards, responsible stewards, not to exploit and destroy his creation, but to act as responsible administrators of a creation that he judges to be very good indeed. So the highest capacity that is now indicated in the created world is the fact that the human beings made in his image are able to hear his word and are able to speak to him. Now, I'm very aware, ladies and gentlemen, and you may be too, that there are many questions about Genesis, and in particular, the details of the days 
that I have not talked about in this lecture. There are two reasons for that. First of all, they take a very long time to talk about. And secondly, if I might do a bit of shameless advertising, I have written a book about them called Seven Days That Divide the World. And so I'll refer you to that. But in the meantime, we have now come to the end of our first talk. Thank you very much.